The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by CNMC, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat Commission. Welcome back to Real Agriculture's Wheat School series. I'm Kara Oosterhaus. Today I have here with me Brian Barris, who is a senior research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. How's it going today, Brian? It's going well. How about you? Great. It's uh, it's We're definitely all getting used to doing a lot of Skype now and changing how the workplace looks, and I know you're dealing with that as well. So we're here to talk about um, enhanced efficiency fertilizers, or EEFs, and um, some of the research you've recently done with them. So what can you tell me a bit about that? Um, I think I think they're gaining a little more prominence now. Um, and, and now's a good time to be having a conversation about it because, um, you know, outside my window here is uh, snow and cold. And so what we would assume in situations like that is that, you know, um, it's not an environment that's conducive to loss. And, and actually some of, the, some of the work that's starting to be developed now, um, you know, actually actually provide some indication that that's not the case, that we can actually have losses in cold soils. Um, and so then, you know, the idea around, well, you know, is an enhanced efficiency fertilizer something that as an input, you know, from a producer perspective, something that I can, you know, afford or justify, you know, in terms of economic returns with that factored in. And, and I think some of the work that we've done from a winter wheat context would show that that's that it's possible for sure. So what are some of the, I guess, it, are there different steps producers need to take if they're getting um, these EEFs ahead of time and storage wise and stuff like that? Um, well, I think, I think a good example um, for an enhanced efficiency fertilizer that, that there was concern about it being somewhat more vulnerable around handling would be um, the ESN or the environmentally smart nitrogen from nutrient. There was concern, you know, back when it entered the marketplace that, um, you know, it's, it's the, the protection is based on, you know, a simple polymer coating around that, that urea prill. And so, you know, by the time you pick it up at the retailer, you know, run it through a drill fill or whatever, to, you know, and into your equipment and how many times does it run through equipment? By the time the air delivery takes it down to the boot jack and puts it in a seed run, um, what is the state of that coating and has it been altered? And so we did quite a bit of research around that uh, and published those results. And, and really, the one concern around it that's easily managed is just for producers, if they're buying that type of product, is to make sure at the retailer point um, you know, if it does go into a blender or whatever for offloading onto your truck uh, to go to your back to your farm is that uh, to make sure that retailer, you know, you know, there there isn't any scaly deposits within that blender itself so that they've run, you know, and they, they know better than I, but, you know, typical run 10 tons of potash through it or whatever, something that's going to, you know, deeper and take those scales off, um, which can be a problem on a polymer coating, you know, if it's handled a bit uh, roughly. And then and then the same thing applies at the farm. Like if you're pulling out your drill for the first time uh, after it's sat for a while, there's certain parts within it, you know, whether it be manifolds or whatever, that could have some scaling. So again, you know, running some rougher product through there first just to make sure everything's clean. And then um, after that, really, we see that, the only other issue that you might run into with ESN is if you're actually top dressing with it, you know, running it through an air boom and it hits those deflector plates before it lands on the ground. Um, you can get some some less than ideal release. In other words, it would act like a regular urea. And there's no point paying for that if it's going to act like a regular re urea. And top dressing is just simply something we wouldn't recommend for ESN anyway for that for one of those reasons, that and the fact that it could get stranded a little bit higher up in that thatch layer of a no-till situation and it requires water and if it's hung up there, the chances of that happening are kind of slim. 
Yeah, and so the issue or the concern around ESN was, you know, if it did release too fast and you're a producer that still has a single shoot type delivery system where seed and fertilizer is going in the same run and then obviously at very close proximity, um, you have to be real careful about the amount of nitrogen you place because you could have toxicity effects. And ESN is, is a standalone product that, in my opinion, is still second to none as far as a, you know, an enhanced efficiency fertilizer that allows you to place, you know, almost all of your nitrogen needs in one shot near the seed. You can put easily with, with, um, with, with cereals three times the, the recommended rate. So you can be pushing right up to, you know, 90 kilograms of N per hectare right in that seed run with your, uh, with your seed and not worry about toxicity effects. And so there was a bit of a concern around, you know, if the, if the coating's damaged and all the work that we did, you know, if you just take those simple mitigation steps at the retailer, um, you're probably going to be fine. It would be also ideal if you avoided using steel flighted augers in your drill fill or whatever when you're handling at home. But um, yeah, for the most part, um, if you're a producer and you still want to put a lot of nitrogen down at planting and you are limited to uh, it being in close proximity to your seed, uh, then ESN or a polymer coated uh, urea would be an excellent choice. And in, and in that regard, um, I think it would more than justify the added input cost. So how do conditions like no-till play into uh, EEFs? Some of the assumptions that we've had about how we can protect, you know, losses, I think, are, are, are requiring a rethink. And, you know, Dr. Regis Karamanos has done a really good job of, of you know, showing some, some research that, that really challenges us to rethink on where those losses are occur or how they occur before it was like you know if you band it um and you know get it protected in in that soil that you won't suffer losses and that's just not the case that we're seeing with some research um uh dr rick angle from montana state university published a really nice paper showing that you did still have volatilization losses in cold soils and so some of these products that protect against volatilization like your urease inhibitors um, or your urease plus nitrification inhibitors, those sorts of products, you know, they have a real role to play in situations like that. And some of the work that we've done with winter wheat, on top of it being a mitigation strategy around loss, you do see some utility and benefit with them, you know, when it comes sometimes in relation to protein and protein yield. But but certainly they seem to pay for themselves in the right situation. You know, a regular urea without any protection at all, if the conditions are right to either go up in the air or, or you know, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, moisture. Um, and and we've, sh we've seen that whether, you know, whether it's a granular or worse yet, if you're in, this, in the right situation, a liquid form like urea ammonium nitrate, We've shown that without a stabilizer, if you're if you're using it at planting, um, you can suffer some pretty significant losses around that. Um, but to be totally honest, it's a little bit like chasing a ghost when you're trying to find those conditions as a researcher. And then, you know, on the knowledge transfer side, say to a producer, you know, you should always have a stabilizer in your liquid N, whether or not you're doing an in-crop application or something at planting. Um, sometimes we can demonstrate it clearly, um, but you know I can do a follow-up study on the same piece of land and have a heck of a time showing it. So it's it's really dependent on environment. Um, but to me, that's one of the probably more volatile forms that are vulnerable to loss that that supports the use of a stabilizer. Um, the idea around you know later on in crop as a you know as a as something that will slow release down so if you've got something like you know something that can something that can sort of prevent losses at multiple points so like something that also has not just a urease inhibitor against volatilization losses but then something packaged in that to prevent against leaching or something like that um, or rapid nitrification like you know your super use or your um, 
instinct and 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 so on um we do see utility in that um in those situations as well so you get if you can prevent the loss you should be able to follow through and see it in some tangible whether it's a bump in grain yield or if you were successful in seeing it slow in terms of release yeah you might see a bump in protein as well 